Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Somerville Neighborhood News Roundup with the Somerville Journal and our wonderful colleague and community partner, Julia Taliesin. Thank you and welcome back. Thank you for having me, Erica. <laughs> of course. Um, so we have a handful of headlines here we're going to discuss some stories that have developed and are continuing to develop. Let's dive into the first item, which are the preliminary elections that just happened. Yeah. What can you tell us about that and the turnout and all those good things? Sure. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go over this because we're heading into a general election season. Um, the citywide general municipal election is on November 5th, mm -hmm. Tuesday. Um, right now, uh, the contested races are the mayor. Mm -hmm. the Ward 3 School Committee, Ward 7 School Committee, and the Counselor at Large race. So those are the right. ones to keep an eye on. Um, but the preliminary election dealt with just the mayoral race and the Ward 3 School Committee race. So there were okay. three candidates in each race, and the preliminary election narrowed it down to two in each, which will be on the ballot on November 5th. Um, so the three candidates for mayor, obviously incumbent Joe Curtitoni, challenger Marianne Wallace, and challenger Kenneth Van Buskirk III. Mm -hmm. um, and the preliminary election and narrowed it down to Marianne Wallace and Joe Curtitoni. Um, both of them, I think Joe Curtitoni had about a 57% and Marianne Wallace had about a 37% um, vote, so relatively significant. Um, Joe Curtitoni took each ward, but um, Marianne was pretty close um, behind in Ward 2. Okay. Um, so it is you know, definitely a race to watch and something to pay attention to. Um, the Journal is going to be reaching out to the candidates with some questions over the next couple weeks to hopefully bring the voters some more information about who they want to elect on November 5th. Excellent. Um, and in the Ward 3 school committee race, uh, the candidates were Michelle Lippin, Sarah Phillips, and Mary Marshall, and the voters narrowed it down to Mary Marshall and Sarah Phillips, with okay. Sarah Phillips getting the most votes, um, but not by a super high margin. So Sarah Phillips and Mary Marshall will be on the ballot on November 5th. Okay. Um, that was a really cool race to watch just because, you know, I, I had the pleasure of speaking with all three women. All of them are total powerhouses and were just so, so graceful, you know, in, in terms of the, the way that they ran their campaigns and were all so there for each other as well in terms of kind of empowering each see. other, which is always really yeah. cool to see in an election, um, especially among women. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. The, the overall turnout was pretty low. It was about a 10% turnout, uh, which means a little over 5,000 voters citywide decided to go and cast their vote vote on September 10th. Um, that's very low. However, in terms of municipal elections, it's not really out of character. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. so typically, um, voter turnout is a lot lower in um, municipal elections in general, and especially in preliminary elections. And given that there were only, there was one citywide vote on the mayor and one ward vote on the Ward 3 School Committee, it's not necessarily a surprise that it was pretty low turnout. But it could be way better on November 5th because we are electing a whole lot of people. There are eight mm -hmm. candidates in the councilor at large pool. That, that's a lot of candidates yeah. you know, in four spots. So there are four incumbents and four challengers, um, lots of you know, new ideas out there. So definitely you know, stay engaged and informed. Yeah, yeah. and we have um, on our website um, the candidate profile mm -hmm. videos that uh, we collaborated on. Mm -hmm. So for people who are looking for just more information, I know that you were sharing those ongoing as oh, well yeah. in, mm -hmm. in the journal. So there are opportunities for people to engage and to learn more about who Absolutely. the people are that are running. Absolutely. There are also, um, I'm going to be taking part in a climate forum. The, um, there's an organization who's hosting just kind of like a candidates, an opportunity for candidates to speak to the issue of sustainability and climate change in Somerville specifically. That's going to be on October 5th. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that as well. Excellent, excellent. Great, thank you. And we'll move on to the next topic, which is the Somerville Police Department at the Straight Pride Parade. And um, what is the story on that? And also maybe a little bit of like a background, a background. in terms of like what, what yeah. happened. Yeah, so, so this, what, gosh. So we're halfway through September now. <laughs> um, so this is, it's been a couple weeks now. So the, the Straight Pride Parade um, happened in Boston, not in Somerville, um, on August 31st. So it's been a little bit. Um, but what happened was because of the expectation of the large crowds, um, both the paraders and the counter protesters, um, the Boston Police Department put out a call to regional units to send in assistance, essentially. So Somerville was not the only city who responded. There were officers there from Quincy, there were Metro officers, transit police, um, 
multiple officers, you know what I mean, from across the region. Um, but specifically, Somerville sent 14 officers who were all part of the COBRA unit, which is our bike patrol unit. Mm -hmm. um, so it was 13 officers and one commanding officer, a deputy chief, who was there to oversee them, who was there with them the entire day. Um, so all some of our officers were there on bikes, like cycles, mm -hmm. not, not motorcycles. Right. Um, and the reason that there has been some fallout is because there, there were many arrests made um, of protesters at that event. So there were about, I think, 36 in total um, of people you know, from all over, all over the region. Um, but there was a lot of video mm -hmm. that was taken by counter protesters at that event. And some of the video shows Somerville officers participating in some of these arrests. Okay. Um, officially, paperwork wise, Somerville officers did not arrest anyone. They were there assisting the Boston police in these arrests. But kind of physically, they were, they were assisting, you know what I mean? So, there was no pepper spray deployed by, deployed by Somerville officers. There were no um, like force reports reported by officers, meaning that there was no <clears throat> use of baton, no use of um, any kind of you know, force weapon of any kind by a Somerville officer. Um, however, they did participate in like the action of you know, taking someone into custody. Right. Um, and in some of these videos, you know, I don't, I don't want to pass a judgment on them, but certain protesters and some of our residents felt that the force being used was excessive. So the, there's video online. You can go on the Somerville website. We have an, um, I'm sorry, on the Somerville Wicked Local website. We have an article up about it with some of that video that was provided to us by people who were there. Um, but what's happening now in the public process that is continuing is that constituents in Somerville were concerned enough that they brought this to their counselors. Right who brought this to the city council and requested the presence of the chief. Um, last week, he went before the council and kind of gave a small report, you know, a short report on kind of why they were there, the um, reason, like the, you know, paperwork that was done. It was a regional request for assistance approved by the chief. It was a volunteer detail. Um, so that kind of information was presented to the city council. Um, but constituents remain really concerned um, about why they were there and the force that was used. So the police department is conducting a full report, which is not yet done. It will probably be done in the next few weeks. Okay. Um, I know that once it is finished, that will be um, shared with the city council, which means it would be a public record. Um, but there's also an ongoing public process around this. So there's going to, um, there's a public hearing that was held. Um, I know that there are several counselors who are still speaking with constituents about letters that were sent to the city council. Um, and people want to see some accountability, but it kind of remains to be seen about what that's going to look like. Right. Um, so really, it's just, it's still an ongoing issue. Sure. You know what I mean? We'll Which, to see this yeah, exactly. Unfold. Yeah, so keep an eye out for some okay. info on that. Thank you so much. That's very informative. Um, the final land transfer mm. to the Samuel Redevelopment Authority. Yes. That so, is. Yeah. Some good news. Yeah, people are pretty excited, I guess. Yeah, so this, what this represents essentially is um, things starting to move mm -hmm. in, in Union Square. We're not quite there yet, <laughs> you know I mean? not quite. Um, but what happened um, last week is there was a pretty small parcel of land that was still owned by the city, meaning it was under the jurisdiction of the city council. Um, so they had been withholding the you know, the transfer of this piece of land to the Somerville Redevelopment Authority as kind of a means of leverage to motivate the developer to engage in good faith negotiations with the Union Square Neighborhood Council to reach this community benefits mm -hmm. agreement. But they did. So we've got the community benefits agreement. It still has to be voted on officially, um, sure. but, it, but it was reached and the developer, you know, negotiated in good faith. People are really excited about the mm -hmm. agreement. And um, finally, yeah, the city council voted to transfer this small piece of land, which you know is the final kind of piece of the D2 block to the Somerville Redevelopment Authority. And what that means is now the Somerville Redevelopment Authority has all the pieces. Mm -hmm. So now they have the power to kind of put them all together 
and sell them to symbolic. the developer. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it really is. We're not. That's why we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it it represents a, a kind of a step forward and a movement forward. So there's still some public process around this that's going to happen. The SRA still has to do all of that. Sure. The you know sale still has to be made. So we're not quite at you know shovels in the ground <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> um, but it you know it it, it is. It represents a, a big step forward. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and Clarendon Hill, there's some recent news going on over there. What is happening? Yeah, so, you know, I, I still feel like I'm learning a lot because this process, Clarendon Hill has it's got a long history mm -hmm. um, and it's been a, a long time coming in terms of this development because they hit a major funding gap which really stalled out the process about a year ago. Um, but just last week, um, the, the, the team uh, the, at, you know, Somerville Community Corporation, Somerville Housing Authority, um, Redgate, you know, and all the many designers who are part of this process, they presented their final designs um, at a wow. community meeting, yeah, which are, it looks amazing. I know nothing about it, you know, <laughs> the detail, um, but it looks really amazing. Um, and, but what this means is that, you know, it's, it's happening. You know what I mean? It's really, it's starting to happen. So we're right, right in the very beginning mm -hmm. of the public process. So, you know, the designs were presented to the community after years, yeah. you know what I mean? Years of public process, right. years of, you know, meeting with the community and trying to figure out how they were going to make it possible and how many affordable units versus market rate units they needed to have and how the parking was going to work and, you know, tons of tons of conversation around yeah. this and now they've finally you know reached this design um, it's a really robust uh, design it's it's a total of about 590 something units um, there's an equal number of affordable public housing units so every person who currently lives there has the option of living there again oh that's so great. it's it's going to be a long process obviously it's going to be years that was a concern exactly for yes yeah. but and you know people there, there's going to be relocation there's you know it's it's not going to be easy or simple or fun necessarily sure. but every resident who lives in a public housing unit has the option of right. living in a finished and new public housing unit once the development is done um, however there's also going to be the addition of several hundred market rate units mm -hmm. which is essentially what they had to do in order to make the project feasible right but there's also, you know, they have a lot of underground parking, a lot of street parking in the development itself. Um, they have, in, you know, improved the parking ratio so that, you know, it's now kind of market level. So okay. it's competitive in the market level. I know at the community meeting, there were some concerns raised about the density of the project and the impact of parking on the neighborhood mm -hmm. and just traffic in general of like, you know, having, you know, more people, which is always, you know, a concern in this it growing an city. ongoing concern. Yeah, here. for everyone, yeah. exactly. Um, but it's it's happening. So now they're going to be moving forward with you know public hearings at the city council, of the zoning board, of the planning board, of all of that. All so there's, the, there's all still the motions, plenty yeah. of opportunity to get involved in the process. So okay. we're just at the beginning, but it's happening now. Excellent. And then in terms of other opportunities for people to get involved, mm -hmm. um, do you have anything you want to talk about with? Um, inviting people for community spotlights or what yes, is the ask for that? Yeah. yeah, so I just have been really aware recently that, you know, there's a lot going on in Somerville with development, with Always. transit, with, you know, traffic, <laughs> with um, a whole lot. And, you know, it's my job, you know, as, as a reporter for the journal, as the sole reporter for the journal to really keep this, you know, residents informed about all of those, you know, nitty gritty, important kind of municipal ongoings. Um, but I also really want this paper to reflect the community, which is more than just traffic and development and all of those things. Um, so I've just been, you know, kind of asking, you know, whenever I'm out there in the world, you know, if you know a person, if you know an organization, if you know a business that has an amazing story and just really kind of represents everything that Somerville is or should be or you want it to be, um, to reach out to us because I want to be highlighting them too. Um, I want to be getting their story out there as well. So Excellent. that's all. I would just ask for people to reach out to me if you know an awesome person or thing. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to reach out to you because I think I know some people. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Anything else? I mean, this was a, this was a great breakdown of the current yeah. current events of Somerville. And that's it. That's it. Awesome. Julia, thank you so much again for coming in. And that concludes this episode of the Somerville Neighborhood News Roundup with the Somerville Journal and we are out and we'll see you next month.